10 years or so, I mean, you've seen amazing strides in, in cities. Um, a lot of it started in New York with Jeanette Sadek Khan, who's a visionary who worked for Mayor Michael Bloomberg and introduced the concept of tactical urbanism, um, repainting over um, streets and, and to turn them into plazas for people to use as parks or for pedestrians, creating bike lanes that reclaim street space from cars and allocate it to um, active transportation. And so I think this is a natural extension of that movement. It opens up opportunities for using that space that has been allocated to sorry, 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 and sorry, sorry, sorry. instead allowing it to be devoted to, um, to other productive purposes that can serve the citizenry, whether that is um, more pedestrian and cycling infrastructure or more sidewalk space where we can have you know, outdoor seating, outside restaurants, creating a sense of urban vitality, whether it's green space and parks, um, or real estate. We know that a, housing has become very expensive in most large cities because of trends toward urbanization. And this may be a moment, um, you know, kind of a, a countervailing trend that allows us to um, build more housing that's sorely needed in those urban areas by taking back parking space. Because it's not just street space, it's also structured parking, parking that zoning laws have required to be um, incorporated into large housing developments and office developments that may no longer be needed and could instead be put toward productive purposes like dwellings. <coughs> Last question. Mm -hmm. The key challenges around uh, overpopulation of cities and, and how to manage how to manage this migration to autonomous cars with the fact that the people that starts to live inside cities are from another social economic level you need to be more democratic uh, how what are the key challenges around yeah, that? So there are a couple things there I mean I think um, it's sort of, the rapid trend toward urbanization is both a blessing and a curse for for urban planners because it has long been thought that moving people into denser living patterns would be an important way to reduce greenhouse gas emissions um, by allowing people to travel fewer miles to get from where they live to where they work. We're reducing the amount of energy that's required to power the transportation system. We're also putting people in environments where um, they're likely to be able to take advantage of sustainable transport options like transit and cycling that are not as available or convenient out in um, suburban areas. So that's a positive. But the, the downside is congestion, putting so many people into such a small space, and the cost at becoming more unaffordable for people of lower economic means to be able to afford to live in these places as they become more popular. So there are tools that cities need to think about from a policy lens uh, so that they can manage those kinds of unintended consequences. Uh, one of those is the idea of congestion pricing or new ways of pricing access to public infrastructure, whether it be um, pricing parking at market rates or levying um, fees for entering the densest districts of cities. This is something that's been experimented with in a number of cities around the world. I think there's an acute need to start looking at much more rapid implementation of that kind of a policy when you see something like um, autonomous vehicles coming on the scene that is going to dramatically reduce the cost of, of vehicle transportation for folks, right? How do you maintain a price incentive for people to choose transit and walking and cycling in an environment where riding a car becomes much cheaper, easier, and less painful in a way? Um, so that's a challenge for cities um, to take on and you know, certainly need to look at, um, at policies around land use as well, making sure that they're not prioritizing space for additional lanes being added to, to city streets to accommodate autonomous cars, but instead you know, looking at, um, at providing other attractive options for people and prioritizing um, the functioning of public transit, in investing in improving the quality of high capacity mass transit, which really can offer the fastest way of getting around big cities. Um, so that people gravitate toward those options on both a, a quality and a price basis. Excellent. Two short, two short questions. Two one, two, uh, I see like a race between two types of companies mm -hmm. after the autonomous vehicles uh, industry. 
-hmm. like the traditional car companies and this was because I was in Munich like a month ago talking with BMW, Volkswagen mm -hmm. Group and all those companies that they are all experimenting and trying to, to, to win that race and the other type of companies, the technology companies, mm -hmm. Google, Lyft, Uber and all of those. Mm -hmm. Who do you think is going to win that race? We're in the middle of a fascinating chess game in which numerous industries are converging the technology industry, the automotive industry, and, um, and we also see you know, traditional automotive suppliers and big tech companies that, you know, that haven't been involved in, um, in transportation in the past alongside small startups that have been offering technology-based transportation services. So I think most of these companies don't yet know which parts of um, the autonomous fleet service model they're going to excel at. At doing and so all of them are experimenting mm -hmm. in trying to do all of the parts yeah. and in, at the same time investing and partnering with other companies in areas where they may have less strength to try to make sure that they have they're hedging their bets that they um, will have a role in you know in, in this kind of a service development as they they start to better understand where their strengths lie so it's a, it's a time mm -hmm. of you know, dynamic change, and they're they're mitigating their risk and trying to uh, explore all of the possible avenues. Ultimately, I mean, the, it's going to require all of these kinds of companies to learn how to do things that they haven't had to do in the past. Great, Emily. And the last question. Oh, she's gonna, can, can we do it by email? Yes, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> I, I told him yeah. it might be a few minutes, so we can do one more. So, okay. Yeah. Okay. One last uh -huh. question. So, in give me a date. When do you think? Because I understand. Oh, I, I there, love this question. There's <laughs> challenges. The technology right. is like almost there. Uh -huh. However, the regulation right. just has a lot of challenges. Yeah. When would you think we're going to have a city, the first city, that is going to be with autonomous, driven by autonomous cars and self-driving vehicles? Ten so years, I think the, you need years? to put a finer point on the question. Because I mean, we have autonomous vehicles in cities today. right? So the question is not when do you have the first autonomous vehicles. The question Working. is when, you know, when will we hit that tipping point exactly. where the vast majority of vehicles become autonomous. And, and that is very dependent on regulation to a great extent, right? And also on um, the commercialization of the technology to a scale that brings down cost, which hasn't yet occurred. So I don't know the answer to that, but I do know that we're seeing the first commercialized autonomous ride services coming on, on our roads this year. Waymo has announced that they are going to be offering a commercial service with the vehicles they've, they've partnered with Jaguar to produce. Um, we heard that just in the last few days, and that they're going to be offering a service with those vehicles on a commercial basis um, within the next year. So Amazing. I think we're the almost there. The future is now. <laughs> Thank the you. future is now. Thank okay, you, you guys, it was fun to talk to you. Thank you very much. For